I'm not saying Bitcoin is the only solution, but this is the alternative rail system that could be a very huge disruptor for the current financial system to be avoided, to be basically eliminated. Because if you don't need a bank anymore to do business, because it's peer to peer, you, you, it's, it's just one counterparty can send money to another counterparty without any bank. So you get rid of all these political nonsense. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the current situation in uh, Russia and Ukraine and um, the effects that it is having on or potentially has on Bitcoin and the monetary situation and financial situation in uh, uh, Russia as well. So we have a lot of uh, things to talk about but we don't have a lot of time for the English room because we have... Um, the Persian room planned for uh, for 6 p.m. my time. So in 55 minutes, we're supposed to have the next room in Farsi. So we're going to try to make this as uh, efficient as possible to go through everything. And um, we have uh, this situation right now going on in Russia, as everyone knows. So... Um, what is, uh, Sina, I'm going to start with this. What is, in your opinion, the importance of Russians' uh, role as an economy worldwide? Right. So basically, one of the easiest way to understand Russian economies is, <clears throat> is to say they are miners of the world. Their economies generally... Uh, based so they're petro state they're based on uh, exporting energy commodities uh, they're the top exporter of natural gas uh, which is about 60 percent of the export revenues for them uh, then they are uh, the, one of the top exporters of uh, oil and the derivatives from oil and gas um, apart from that, they are uh, exporting a lot of fertilizer. They're, they're one of the important exporters of fertilizers, nitrogen-based, potash-based, uh, which are really important for determining food prices in the future. But it gets also mo more complicated because they are also one of the most important exporters of wheat. So both of these... Uh, so you're going to have issues later in, in food supply chain in finding the grains uh, and also growing them. Uh, they're also, you know, an important exporter of iron ore. Uh, they're one of the largest exporters of semi-finished iron and low-quality steel. Uh, same, same thing is with nickel. And interesting, interestingly, both iron ore and nickel are needed to make stainless steel. So these supply chains are also dependent on Russian exports. And uh, another important metal they are a big player in is uh, platinum group, uh, rhodium, palladium, things like that. They are used uh, highly in electronics. So if you're using a uh, cell phone or something, uh, you have one of these, uh, basically some of these metals in those products. Uh, they, are, they also export a lot of coal, coal. but apart from these, uh, it's hard to find them being important players in other areas. So basically their economy is very uh, simple, it's not complex. And then a complex economy is defined as one that has a lot of different sectors working in it. So, you know, upstream commodity providers and suppliers, uh, machinery producers, uh, product manufacturing service providers, retail transportation. Uh, they are they are not they don't have a vibrant complex economy. So uh, basically, mostly uh, focused on extracting things from the ground and shipping them uh, outside. Uh, 
Uh, although in, in those specific markets, especially energy, because they are, they are, uh, they have a, a big bargaining position and they, they supply most of, most of the demand, uh, that gives them power in that regard. But it's also a very tricky position because not only the world depends on their energy, they also depend heavily on exporting that energy and being able to export it. So if, uh, if their trade partners try to limit their purchases and, and work or find some workaround, uh, Russia will be severely hit. So they are also in a very risky position. Uh, it, it's not balanced to only say that the world depends on them. Dependence works the other way too. Um, and then they're also attacking Ukraine, right? So Ukraine is also an important player in uh, in the petrol market and, and the food market. So uh, these two supply chains will be severely uh, hit in, in, as we go into the future, especially even before this war, uh, food supply chains were already under stress, fertilizer were already, was already short, and people were predicting food shortages and famine around the world. Now this only you know makes that a 2x, 3x bigger problem. Uh, we had a similar issue with energy. Um, they basically, you know, governments around the world decided that they want to hamper their own energy production, supply chains, and uh, energy capacity. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about Germany shutting down their uh, nuclear reactors. Uh, similarly, many countries in the West have underinvested in energy, so that was already setting us up for a bull market in energy and commodities. Uh, that was all before the war, and this just makes that uh, several more times uh, problematic. Um, and basically, but, but other than that, the, Russia doesn't have a lot of technology or product exports, um, more complex uh, machinery export. So, um, also important to know that most of their impact is going to be on, on Europe and uh, East Asia. U.S. has very limited exposure um, in the energy sector and a little bit in the palladium group sector. But other than that, uh, U.S. is more insulated from this uh, the economic fallout of this war. Okay, understood. Um, very interesting. Okay, so um, I mean, it, it it seems like they they they. I mean, they're not the biggest economy in the world, right? There is, there there there. Are, I think uh, on on uh, on the eleventh place when it comes to the size of their uh, of their economy size. Uh, however, I mean, the 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 concept of um, this aggression behind uh, Russia's um, war, I think it is quite important to talk a little bit about that and maybe from there we can move on to discuss the effects that it could have on uh, the financial system uh, within Russia and of course its ripple effect on other financial systems and then um, at the end maybe we can talk a little bit about Bitcoin. So. Um, I've, uh, you sent me a very, very interesting video yesterday that I watched, which was very fascinating. And it was talking about this um, this tremendous uh, issue that Russia is facing from the NATO and essentially all these gas uh, discoveries that uh, was made in Ukraine. Can you maybe talk a little about, uh, a little bit about that and then we can take it from there? and discuss a little bit more about the financial effects of it. So the gas discoveries of uh, that happening in Ukraine? Yes, exactly. And, and, and what could be the reason behind the motivation of, of, of uh, Putin? There, there are several scenarios. Obviously, we, are, we, we don't have sufficient information. And uh, uh, for anyone to claim they exactly know what's in Putin's head is, uh, frankly, uh, you know, ridiculous, but there are several uh, possible scenarios. So they have a lot of interest in the Eastern Ukraine, uh, the Russian speaking people who are sympathetic to Russia. So 
capturing that land might also have not only uh, the, the give them the privilege of having more land access, but also those areas population-wise, demographic-wise, they are uh, m more sympathetic to Russia, so easier to, easier to integrate. And maybe uh, they, they will also be willing to do that uh, uh, and not resist an occupation or so. So it, it will also give them the ability to connect Crimea to, 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 to the north and, and allow, allow them easier maneuvering. Uh, but in Western Ukraine, I'm not entirely sure uh, what would be the, the plan. It's hard to think Russia wants to capture the whole Ukraine and keep it for long run because the cost of that would be uh, would be prohibitive. Even even if they they try to install a puppet or something, uh, it's a, it's a major challenge. So we'll see what's going on there. But apart from that, Ukraine is on on the route for uh, export uh, gas exports to Europe. So a lot of a lot of the, actually the majority of the Russian gas goes through Ukraine and it's, it's uh, the statistics I've seen, it's, it's larger than Nord Stream 1 uh, e either. So basically that's a huge, you know, uh, a strategic place for securing the energy. Uh, it, it is also very possible that m not many people within Russia knew about it. We're getting reports saying that, you know, s people are surprised uh, you know, the soldiers were like, you know, we never thought uh, that this was the plan and things like that. And, and so things remain very, very uncertain there. Uh, but explanations related to energy and security seem to be uh, most tenable to me. It's interesting because, you know, the video that you sent me that I watched yesterday, and I also watched another interview that I would like to mention in this room today. So... Um, basically, the uh, video that, that uh, you sent me yesterday was basically uh, theorizing two possible scenarios. One possible scenario was the complete capture of Ukraine, right? That was uh, the theory that you just uh, explained. And the other one would be because of the discoveries of the Russian, sorry, of the Ukrainian government in 2013, because they have apparently discovered a lot of uh gas right a lot of natural gas resources have been discovered throughout 2013 and 14 and by then it was not a huge problem because russia was in charge uh through its puppet uh, regime in uh ukraine which was pro russia but uh, ever since that government has fallen uh, we have this pro western uh government right now that is ruling the country, you have more and more of the political system leaning towards the West, signing an agreement or about to sign an agreement with the NATO and also signing an application to join the EU. So this is a huge problem because if that would happen, the entire dependency of the West from Russia's gas resources would be completely eliminated. So Russia has an incentive to protect itself and its uh, uh, natural gas resources and dependency by either capturing Ukraine completely or by at least capturing the lower southern part of Ukraine, which is basically the border to the sea where all these ga natural gases were discovered. So uh, all the propaganda you see on, 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 on television of course, they don't talk about this, but that's the truth. It's all about money. It's nothing about, you know, um, uh, uh, what is he talking about? To get, get rid of neo-Nazis who are active in Ukraine and stuff. That's all just an excuse. This is all about money. They want to keep their dependency alive that they have with, with, with uh, Europe. And uh, the other thing that you have to think about is, I, I was watching this other interview uh, last week, which is from a journalist that is an absolute independent journalist, not in the traditional news media active, but uh, a very much independent, um, 
half Russian and I can pin that to the room. Right now I have pinned our live video on this room, by the way. If anyone wants to see us live, just click on the YouTube link. Uh, we're live on YouTube as well. So if you want to see our faces, you can go there. Um, so I was watching this video. I was watching this interview. It's a very neutral, uh, half French, half uh, Russian journalist who studied and grew up in the US, right? So it's, it's a person who has a background from both sides and it's, it, he's a very rational person. You can check him out. This video, this interview was published around three years ago, 2018. He gave this speech in a university in the US and the things he says are quite astonishing right he goes through the entire history of the soviet union uh, of the of the ussr and how the the russians got split from ukrainians and uh, after the world war 2 and uh, that was in 1991 i think exactly where the soviet union got split and ever since russia is struggling to get aligned with the west right that's the problem that Russia is facing. And in 2006, he was asking in Brussels to become a member of, um, to become a member of the, um, nah, what's the name? Uh, not the EU, but the military uh, alliance of the West. What was the name? Sorry, I forgot. NATO. Of the NATO, exactly. So 2006, he is asking, for the guarantees of the NATO that were given to the Soviet Union, right? And what he got as a response was pretty much like, that was not you, that was the Soviet Union, you're Russia, right? So he, he wanted to, I mean, and, I'm, I'm not, and I'm not saying that everything he's doing right now is right, I'm just telling you what happened. OK, he wanted to be part of the NATO and the NATO utterly rejected his request. And there is no reason why he wouldn't he wouldn't be part of the NATO. He could be part of the NATO. But for whatever reason, the NATO countries rejected his request. And ever since he doesn't trust the West anymore and he's trying to push back because the NATO is coming further and further and further. Uh, although the NATO promised uh, at the beginning before the uh, 90s that they would never expand further than the German border. But they have not kept that because the Soviet Union uh, got split and the promise was made to them. And now they're getting further and further close to Russia. So if Ukraine would uh, even join the NATO, that would completely surround Russia with all the Western countries. And if you ask me, I wouldn't feel uh, I would I would also feel very, very much threatened if I see the West coming further towards me and rejecting my offer to even join them. Right. Which doesn't, of course, justify any type of aggression or war. That's not what I'm saying, but that's essentially what has happened. Yeah, I mean, if you dig through this, uh, there is deep history there and there is uh, a lot of provocation that was done here. Um, so certainly you cannot basically say that um, either party is in the right in this. Uh, <clears throat> but also my position has always been, you know, even if you're losing a political battle over something, just nothing justifies uh, attacking innocent people. That said, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, the Western countries, US and other ones, they've also done uh, a lot of intervention around the world, which has not been criticized sufficiently. So I guess it's important to stay balanced, but at the same time, uh, for me, there's a, uh, there's a big concern seeing the human impact. So basically, uh, and also, you know, people are really complicating uh, the, these, um, situation you know this is like this is a battle between two powers and obviously on the edge where the two powers are meeting there's going to be uh you know battle and confrontation and 
and each side is going to push for gaining more advantage. And this uh, wasn't something that was, you know, unexpected. As West is getting richer, they're going to try to expand further, and Russia would try to do anything it can to push back. So um, this is just battle for power, and Russia has felt very, very threatened. So that's that's what we see. And uh, uh, however, I I I I'd rather. Uh, analyze the economic impacts of this because we uh, information is very limited here and people's sentiments are really strong so uh, you know getting into that conversation basically uh, it to me is a distraction when we don't have enough information maybe we can dive into uh, the juicy part right so the economics part and the effect that uh, this could have on Bitcoin so uh, we had an offline discussion yesterday that was pretty interesting uh, about what might happen if uh, Russia would face some sort of financial sanctions. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that and uh, what it would mean for uh, something like Bitcoin. Um, so basically, let, let, let's first talk about the uh, general uh, uh, fallout of this. Uh, so we talked about the importance of Russia for the world economy and, and which supply chains are going to be hurt. Uh, I want to also, before uh, expanding on that, I want to mention that our supply chains have been running extremely lean uh, over the past, you know, 40, 50 years since we learned from, since we learned the Toyota production system and lean manufacturing and we saw that its success, that got that got replicated around the world in many uh many many supply chains and industries and basically what lean systems do are uh, is is to get rid of inventory and excess in the system that's why it's called lean so you get rid of all the fat and you run on minimal resources but very well managed to uh, uh down to the day such that like many facilities receive what they're producing in the morning and within a day or two, all of that is processed and out. You don't see fat and inventory sitting here and there. There's no excess capacity. And then uh, also another source of cost is, you know, several suppliers. So companies have been trying to concentrate. That's what they, you know, euph euphemistically they call rationalize rationalization of supply base. So if you had four suppliers around the world, it would be economically an official on one of the cheaper prices in the world and maybe get rid of the one that's that's domestically available but at higher prices. So over time, uh, supply chains have become very lean and cost efficient. That's why we have a lot of cheap cheap goods available. But they have grown huge amount of dependence on certain regions, depending on the industry, as well as very limited excess capacity. So supply chains are extremely fragile. That's why you know, volatility in the supply somewhere in the world causes this ripple effect everywhere as we see in the chip shortage issue and as we will see in a lot of shortages that are going to come. Um, these are drivers that will keep inflation high, even though people think uh, this, uh, still there are people who think inflation is, is a temporary thing and it's going to go away. I even doubt that with, uh, with, with the small levels of tightening that the Fed is trying to do, we will go back to a, a low inflation regime anytime soon because of these factors. Now, obviously inflation uh, is gonna cause people to realize that uh, currency, fiat currency's value is, uh, is basically uh, dwindling. It's not the place to be. So they'll find for things to basically park their money in um, it, it's very funny, uh, Seyfedin has this great take in his book that he says, uh, fiat system is, you know, forces you to earn your money twice. You first need to work for it and earn it. Then you need to find a way to prevent it from being stolen by politicians. Basically, 
Uh, that that's going to be a huge driver for Bitcoin adoption. People are going to realize that inflation is a big deal. And and you you if you track the statistics, we should see any time like inflation is mentioned, you should see as an uptick in Bitcoin being mentioned. Um, uh, it would be really interesting to track these things in Google searches. Uh, but apart from that, there's a lot of speculation about. Uh, basically, you know, Russia as a country adopting Bitcoin to circumvent the uh, sanctions. Uh, but I still view that as a little bit too optimistic because uh, there are many issues for Russia to adopt Bitcoin. Uh, one of them is uh, Bitcoin is very small. Uh, uh, it's hardly a one trillion asset. And for a country to conduct billions of dollars of deals in Bitcoin, uh, you know, it'd be very hard for them to find liquidity. Basically, you know, money is a network. It's as useful as your ability to find partners that basically uh, the first section that's about money is explain how money works. Um, money is a promise to pay in future, a promise of trade in future. So you have provided a service to me, and through that exchange of money, I give you the promise to you to be able to sell. And it's only as good as your ability to spend your it in the future, and you find bad. another trade partner that will accept your connection. Uh, that money. Your connection is breaking, uh, Sina. I think uh, you have, but I think now you're back. We lost you for a second. The okay. connection was poor, but I think you're back. S sorry, go on, go on. All right. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, I, was, I was saying money is a network and, and uh, its value, its utility is proportional to your ability to find other trade partners that will accept that money. So if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to make billion dollar deals, you have to find billion dollar Bitcoin buyers. And that's a bit, uh, a, a bit of a stretch to say that Bitcoin can do it at that moment, especially uh, at the country level. So that, that's gonna be very hard. Um, at the same time, it's a very, like I said, it's a very small asset. So even if Russia finds a partner that will accept uh, that much Bitcoin, uh, then, uh, you know, the immediate intervention in that market is going to cause the price to go up. As soon as they want to do the deal, they have to buy the Bitcoin, right? So they have to buy, uh, maybe find people who would uh, receive rubles from them and give them Bitcoin, right? And that's going to that's gonna just get harder and harder as we go. And it's going to lead to a major effect on Bitcoin's price and limits Russia's ability to buy Bitcoin. So... Uh, it, it basically gonna wreak havoc in the market as well if they, if they if they get involved. Another thing is, you know, even more than anything, this is not a technical issue. If if the problem of Russia is not find not able not being able to find trade partners, if trade partners are refusing to trade with them, uh, you can't circumvent that by finding a different way of sending money. It, that's not the problem. The problem is finding the partners. And, and uh, uh, so, uh, and, and use of Bitcoin or any other system wouldn't solve that. Uh, although Bitcoin it plays the, its most important role uh, for people. People of Russia, that are also being impacted heavily by, by what's happening. And over the last decade or so, if you look at the ruble's value, it's been constantly going down. Heavily after each war, it has had a leg down. So that basically means that you know people's savings are going away, and and pe it's the people who are paying for. So yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting. Maybe a little bit of my thoughts um, with regards to uh, Bitcoin. Um, I, first of all, I, I completely agree with what you're saying that uh, Bitcoin is essentially way too small to be used right now as a settlement layer for very large amounts, especially when it comes to large countries uh, like um, Russia. Um, 
However, since everything is right now is settled, is settled through the SWIFT system and uh, on the fiat lay, uh, rails, I do believe that on uh, the country's level, on the government's level, it, Bitcoin can play a very large role to, uh, first of all, um, act as a safe haven for countries and governments to accumulate w Bitcoin in order to protect themselves from the dollar's uh, inflation rate, um, not only on an individual level, but also on the um, country level. That's one thing. And the other thing is that I, I really think that uh, a company, or sorry, a country like Russia could really benefit uh, if the country gets cut off the SWIFT system to at least uh, use some other rails, right? It doesn't have to be exclusively Bitcoin because of the exact reason that you just mentioned, which is liquidity, because it's not as big as it's supposed to be in order to uh, satisfy the amount of volume that a country like, like uh, you know, Russia would need. However, it could use, uh, for example, uh, the Chinese currency system, it could even create its own currency system that uh, uh, would be an alternative. However, there is one more thing to consider here. Um, it is a huge game theoretical race right now who is going to basically opt out of the dollar system as the U.S. weaponizes its dollar dominance or uh, its dollar reserve status, right? Because ever since the dollar has become the world reserve currency, the U.S. has used its currency to oppress other countries and to basically make them what they want, right? And what what m many people don't understand it's it's not only a technical thing that the us can do it's also uh, from a sanctions perspective a political problem for other nations to deal with some entities or countries that the us doesn't like let me give you an example there is a there is a list you can google it the sdn list uh, the sanctions uh, list of the US. So basically, Vladimir Putin was put on that list last week as an individual. So let me explain what that means. Even if Vladimir Putin can access the SWIFT system, but he is on the SDN list, any bank or intermediary who has political interest on the West, which is the US, European Union, and every major Western country, right? Would be in danger to do business uh, or would put himself in danger to come on the same list like Vladimir Putin if he does transactions for this individual, right? So if the US has this capacity, this political uh, capacity to put individuals or banks on this specific list that I just mentioned and you have to imagine every bank in the world follows this list so if the US puts for example your company on that list no bank that has a tiny bit of interest to do business with Western countries would do business with you not because it's technically not possible but rather because Politically, it's a suicide. They have to close their doors because there is no other business coming to them because they would be shut out of the entire banking system. So you can be an entity who has access to the financial system, to the SWIFT system, but still be SDN and completely screwed. And no one would want to do business with you because if they did, they would expose themselves to a problem that for example, if they ever travel to the US, they get arrested because they did business with an SDN, right? Who wants that? No one wants that, right? So it's one thing is the technical payment rails that uh, is 
namely the SWIFT system. The other thing is the sanctions policies that the US can put on individuals, entities, and countries, and even industries, right, that can put a huge amount of pressure on a country like Russia. Let me give you an example. During the Iran deal, when Obama was president with Iran, there were certain industries that were under sanctions and certain industries that were not under sanctions from the perspective of the US. Okay? From the perspective of the European Union, there was even less sanctions there, right? So if you are a European bank and you have business going on with Iran, you could do certain businesses that were not under sanctions, but you could, uh, uh, sorry, you could not do certain businesses because they were under sanctions, but you could do certain businesses with Iran because they were not sanctioned, right? Like food, pharmacy, uh, automobiles, and so on and so forth. After Trump became president and that deal was gone, the sanction, uh, the, the sanctions policy of the U.S. towards Iran got completely changed. So what happened was that deal was canceled, even though it was not even legal what he did. But what he did, because he could do it because he's, 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 the, he's the president of the U.S. So what happened after was you could only do food and pharma business with Iran, nothing else. And guess what? Banks were even afraid to do that because you have to think about it this way. If you are a bank and you can decide whether you, are, you, want, to, you want to risk your entire banking license or banking, um, uh, banking infrastructure to get sanctioned because you did some small payments to an entity in Iran for food and pharma, what, would you do that? Of course you wouldn't. So instead of doing any business with Iran, you cut it completely off your system. You don't uh, make financial rails available to this country at all because you don't want to risk your own business because you want to do business with Europe. You want to do business with the US. You want to keep that business alive. It's just an incentive that every banker has um, to basically follow the money. Where is the money? Where can I make money? If, 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 if there is too much risk to do business with Iran, I don't do business with Iranians because if I do, I cannot do business with Germans or I cannot do business with Americans, right? So that's the risk and that's where Bitcoin could shine, right? I'm not saying Bitcoin is the only solution, but this is the alternative rail system that could be a very huge disruptor for the current financial system to be avoided, to be basically eliminated. Because if you don't need a bank anymore to do business, because it's peer to peer, you, you, it's, it's just one counterparty can send money to another counterparty without any bank. So you get rid of all these political nonsense that individuals can do legal business and uh, use biz uh, use Bitcoin for just one more one more example Sina and then and then we can maybe move on to to the end of this room and then we can go to the Persian room so if you are an Iranian individual right now and you are in Iran you cannot send money to Europe even though it is absolutely legal to do so there is nothing illegal about it to send money to Europe. Not at all. Not even from the perspective of the US. If you, for example, want to send money to your mother who lives in Europe, you cannot do that. Why? Because the banks, the intermediaries, as I explained, have a political interest not to serve you. So you got this traditional network that is captured and controlled and uh, basically is being weaponized against 
against any political enemy. And then you have this network that's free and open to anyone and by nature, it doesn't discriminate. And uh, uh, just like you said, on the margins, we will see a migration from the old system to the new system. The harder it gets, the harder it gets to use the old system. So the more they use it as a weapon, the more they use it to censor people, to kick people out, you will see the faster transition from the old system to the new one. And if you look at the incentives of people, there are, uh, there are people who, there are many institutions who are the beneficiaries uh, of the fiat infrastructure and the petrodollar. They will be the last to, to move to Bitcoin, but, they're, but they are basically using that power to take advantage of many other participants, many other countries around the world. Those are the ones that have the biggest incentives to, to switch to Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we covered uh, pretty much everything we wanted to talk about. We were very efficient, actually, pretty much on time. So uh, if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. We can bring you up on stage. You can ask your questions about this topic. Uh, but please, only if it's related to this topic we're talking about. You can also alternatively DM me the question and um, you can also uh, put your question on our YouTube. Um, the link to the YouTube channel is um, on the room here. It's pinned on top of the room. So you can also go there and ask your questions on the comment section. Uh, but other than that, I think we went through everything we wanted to talk about, Sina. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, no, no, just uh, it will be very fun to watch what happens to Bitcoin as we move forward. Uh, in the past few days, we've had this monster rally, which is very, very interesting because it came right when all those TradFi guys were saying, oh yeah, Bitcoin was supposed to you know, be show its value in un unstable times and it hasn't. So it's just another risk asset. And they're probably now scratching their head thinking, what the heck? Yeah, especially interesting is that Bitcoin was seen as this risk on asset. And now it starts to decouple from risk on assets, right? It's becoming because Bitcoin is just misunderstood as a risk on asset. It's in its nature inherently a risk of asset because it is absolutely independent and it is outside of the current mess we, we find ourselves in. So um, I agree with you. It's quite interesting to watch and it is... Um, going to be uh, very, very fascinating to watch when the market starts to wake up.